but uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, first, we wanted to point out one. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this session, Ognyan Oreshko, uh, fellow USC alumni, alumnus. He's going to talk about fault tolerant quantum computation via adiabatic holonomies. Please thank him in advance. Thank you, Kale. It's really a pleasure to be back at USC. Um, about four years ago, uh, I talked um, here about a preliminary version of some of this work. But since then, our understanding has evolved significantly, and there have been some new results. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so um, here is an outline of my talk. Um, I will um, give you a brief, brief introduction uh, about geometric phases and holonomic quantum computation. And then I will uh, describe a slight extension of the original model for holonomic quantum computation, which performs computation in subsystems as opposed to a, a subspace, um, uh, which will be uh, helpful for understanding how it is possible to combine these geometric ideas with the methods for fault-tolerant computation on um, stabilizer codes. And then I will um, describe two approaches uh, to fault-tolerant holonomic quantum computation. Uh, one of them is the original that we proposed. It um, works on a stabilizer code, as you know it. It uses no extra qubits, but requires Hamiltonians that depend on the codes that you use. And the other one uses extra gauge qubits, but um, it uses Hamiltonians which are independent of the code and also allows for reducing the locality of the Hamiltonian to two using uh, with gadgets. I will discuss some potential advantages or disadvantages of this approach and also some related schemes and then I will conclude with a few remarks. Um, so, holonomic quantum computation is based on geometric phases. A geometric phase is a phenomenon that occurs under parallel transport in a curved space. For instance, consider a sphere and a vector which lives in the tangent plane at a given point. And if it is parallel transport, which means in a way that it remains parallel to itself during, during the uh, transport along the dotted curve, it is going to follow this evolution such that when you bring it back to the initial point, it's going to be rotated by some angle phi which is a holonomy. And this idea is not restricted to transport of vectors on a tangent space, but you can imagine any curve, uh, any manifold with uh, where at each point you have an associated vector space or an even more general space. And the parallel transport is a some rule which tells you how to transport the information in this uh, space as you move along the manifold. Uh, it is described by a gauge potential and this idea is actually ubiquitous in physics where the fundamental interactions are described by uh, gauge fields. Interestingly, it is the same idea that appears in adiabatic uh, dynamics on which the holonomic uh, approach to quantum computation is based. Um, the holonomy that you acquire in this or in other cases is actually proportional to the flux of the curvature uh, through the area that you enclose. So to review the adiabatic theorem, here I'm going to use a version which is non-controversial. It uh, works for degenerate uh, eigenspaces of the Hanum and is due to Kato back in the 1950. Um, so basically consider a time-dependent Hamiltonian which changes along a curve, uh, along a curve of Hamiltonians which is parameterized by a parameter S from zero to one. The, the dependence of time is given by that. So S is actually the current time divided by the total time of evolution. And let's assume that this family of Hamiltonians has a um, S-dependent eigenspace which is separated from the rest of the spectrum by a gap. Uh, and uh, assume that this, uh, the projector on this eigenspace is twice differentiable. Then the statement is that if we slow down the evolution, if we slow down the change of the Hamiltonian along the curve, in the limit when the, the slowdown goes to infinity, uh, any, the evolution generated by this Hamiltonian will be such that any state that begins in the eigenspace is going to remain in the eigenspace during the evolution for all time. 
But furthermore, this theorem also tells us how the eigen the, the state is going to change within the eigen space. And this is, um, in order to express this, we need to introduce an S-dependent basis for the subspace. And considering an initial state psi of zero, it is going to evolve, uh, its transformation will be described by the following expression, where you have a geometric phase, which is simply the integral of the energy, and there is this geometric quantity, which is a sequence, a continuous sequence of projectors along the subspace, along this curve, and the transformation that it, that it corresponds to can be de described in this form. Well, these are J of zero uh, uh, is the basis frame in the initial space, and J of S is uh, the basis frame at time S, and this U, U IJ is actually a unitary transformation given by the following expression. It's a path-ordered exponent of, of a quantity, which is given by this, uh, uh, by this expression. This is actually the Wilczek Z uh, connection, which describes how, in a most parallel fashion, the states that are in the subspace are going to evolve along the curve. But this unitary, uh, actually, as you can see, depends, depends on the choice of basis. So in, which, in our case, the choice of basis is a gauge freedom, which is not physical. But if there is a method, to, if there is some natural rule that fixes the final frame, we actually can get rid of this gauge freedom and obtain a gauge invariant quantity. And this is the case when we take the subspace along a loop such that it go, comes back to itself. The requirement that the basis at the final time is identical with the one that we started from removes the gauge freedom and we obtain this gauge invariant quantity called the holonomy associated with the path um, that we take the space in. So in this picture, I'm considering a path in the, what is called the Grassmannian. The Grassmannian is, a, is the space of all subspaces of a given dimension. Um, so on what parts of the Grassmannian we can take a given subspace depends on the Hamiltonians that we can engineer, of course. And, uh, but it was shown by Zanardi and Rossetti that in the generic case, um, given some reasonable assumptions about the, your control abilities, we can actually obtain uh, holonomies in a given subspace which can generate the entire unitary group. And they propose this as a method for quantum computation, which is what holonomic quantum computation is. Um, and this idea, besides being very fascinating from a conceptual point of view, uh, has attracted significant attention due to its um, uh, due to the robustness that it promises. So on one hand, this is uh, adiabatic dynamics, which gives you some robustness against timing errors. So as long as you're in the adiabatic limit, and for instance, you're interpolating between some Hamiltonians, it doesn't matter precisely at what time you'll be able to switch on your interaction and, or turn it off. Uh, as long as you're in the adiabatic limit for so satisfactory precision, you can, you can take your time and traverse the loop um, with, um, with uh, timing that you like. And also, of course, since this is adiabatic, the idea is that uh, the, the Hamiltonian itself, the gap can protect you from some kind of errors. In addition, the geometric nature of the gates supplies you with some additional robustness against those classes of errors which, which uh, change the, the path in such a way that it preserves the flux. Because remember that the holonomy that you generate is uh, equal to the flux of the curvature area that you enclose. But these statements should be taken with care because there are also various errors against which this, is not, this approach would not be robust. For instance, the splitting of, this, uh, of the ground space is going to result in very bad errors. And if you, especially since you are doing this evolution slowly, this splitting is going to cause transformation in your cold space, which, uh, which is going to accumulate and can it can be detrimental to your computation. So even if robust, even if we're able to engineer very well such a system, I mean, every system interacts with its environment, so we need to find ways to combat errors if we, need to, if we would like to use this approach to quantum computation as a really a reliable approach. And one uh, possible solution has been considered by Zanardi and Lidar, which is to encode in a decoherence-free subspace, uh, 
and they have shown that for some um, natural it is, it is possible to do holonomic computation in a coherent free subspace, but of course, this requires certain symmetries, and no symmetry is ideal, so inevitably there will be errors uh, due to interaction with the environment, and similarly, there are errors due to, due to control imperfections. In addition, I mean, scalability of any method requires the ability to do it fault tolerantly, so it is also desirable that we should somehow be able to, uh, if we conceive this method as a universal method for computation, to combine it somehow with fault tolerant methods for computation. And all this is telling us that we need to somehow uh, unify this approach with active error correction. And one attractive prospect is that assuming that uh, uh, the holonomic approach provides us indeed with some control robustness, this control robustness could aid the, uh, the uh, protection provided by quantum error correction. So in order to understand how this works, I would like to introduce a slight modification of what was already uh, introduced as an approach to holonomic uh, computation, which is in a subspace. So um, the idea is to develop it such that it can capture the most general form of encoding, which is in, uh, a faithful encoding, which is encoding in subsystems. This is known as the so-called uh, subsystem principle. And this is particularly relevant in the context of information protection. Uh, a subsystem is a tensor factor of a subspace, such as, for instance, H with subscript I and superscript A in this decomposition. So here in this decomposition, we have a sum of different orthogonal subspaces labeled by I. And each of them factors into two, and the two factors are, have, uh, are A and B. The reason why I'm showing this particular decomposition is that it is known to be associated with the structure of preserved information under open quantum systems, uh, as shown by these people. In fact, um, this can be viewed as a hybrid uh, quantum classical code, where the protected quantum information resides in the subsystem A, and the classical information is associated with the different subspaces in which we have such uh, no, uh, code sub, um, subsystem codes. Um, here is one example that we should all be familiar with, a, a standard quantum error correcting code. Let's assume that there is a code which explores the full Hubert space. The, the statement that the information, if it, is, if it has remained protected, can be found in a subsystem actually corresponds to the fact in this case that um, there is a decomposition of the full Hubert space of, of the of this following form where the logical information, even if an editable error has occurred, can be retrieved. It is contained in this factor and, all, and this other cofactor contains the error syndromes and possibly gauge degrees of freedom. The code space itself, the one in which we prepare our information, is actually the sub, uh, is HA tensored with the span of some fixed vector, which, is, which, which we write as zero here. This corresponds to the, uh, to the error syndromes being initialized to zero, meaning that we're in the code, in the original code space. Actually, from this point of view, error correction can be seen like this. I mean, we prepare this, the, the state, the logical information in the subsystem A, and keep in mind that this is a, um, this is a virtual subsystem, meaning that the observables that, that describe it are actually non-local, and the syndromes are in the state zero, and when an error, cor uh, a correctable error occurs, what it does is that it simply excites the cost, and it sends it to some generally mixed state in HB, and then the correction is simply to reinitialize that state. This concerns correctable errors. Now, it is desirable now in, uh, to, to develop um, a, pro, uh, a formulation, as I said, more general formulation of holonomic computation, which is um, compatible with this uh, general uh, notion of encoding, which is encoding in subsystems. And this can be captured in the following uh, theorem. So consider uh, any decomposition of the Hilbert space of that form, where we'll be interested in the, lo the information contained in the subsystems HAI. Um, the statement is that if we choose a starting Hamiltonian of this form, Basically, it acts trivially on the subsystems that contain the logical information and non-trivially on the co system. And here for different i's, 
uh, these are different subspaces, we require Hamiltonians have a different spectrum. The statement is that if we start with this Hamiltonian and change it adiabatically, so that there are no crossings of energy levels, given sufficient control abilities, it is possible to take these subsystems around loops in such a way that we are going to generate a unitary where the transformation of this form, where the transformations in the, sub the logical subsystems are purely geometric and any set that we desire and all unwanted dynamical phases can be absorbed in, in the, cos in the cos -up systems B, labeled by B. And one, one interesting consequence of this statement is that um, when we have the situation where the Hilbert space uh, factors into two, we can actually uh, implement an arbitrarily purely geometric transformation on the subsystem A without having to initialize the system in any, uh, in any subspace. Uh, you might, uh, specifically, if you're given a system, you can append to it some qubit in an unknown state. You just turn on a Hamiltonian which acts uh, non-trivially on that qubit, on that gauge qubit. Uh, you adiabatically uh, change it in such a way that you end up again with a Hamiltonian acting on that qubit. And you leave your original system with a purely geometric transformation. The way this is done, I am not showing the proof here, but it is based on the idea that you perform different computations uh, in the different eigenspaces of your Hamiltonian, and you do it in such a way that the desired transformation factors out and it remains on the, sub on the subsystem A that you are interested in. And this approach can be useful um, in, this, uh, in that it saves on uh, initialization procedures. So, um, in the case of when we do uh, full tolerant quantum computation and not necessarily holonomically, even in the dynamical case, uh, we are also moving the logical subsystem around. So I think it is useful to, to get the idea of how holonomic computation works to also consider uh, full tolerant quantum computation in that, uh, in, in that uh, picture of um, a, subsyst a logical subsystem being moved, ar moved around. So uh, consider a stabilizer code where the logical information is, uh, will be contained in one subsystem A and all syndrome and gauge degrees of freedom are here. I mean, ideally we would like to do just correction, which means initializing this, uh, the state of this subsystem B back to the code space. And we would like to perform computation, so we would like to, to perform some non-trivial evolution inside HA. But the thing is that for this quantum error, this quantum error correction wor uh, works because uh, the logical observables are highly non-local. So this means that you would need a highly non-local Hamiltonian to achieve this. Uh, but in reality, we have to implement um, computation as a sequence of um, using, using local Hamiltonians. This means that inevitably, you have to take the information outside of this code. Um, so, and during the evolution, uh, during the evolution, you are going to have a time-dependent decomposition of this type, which is related to the initial one by some unitary, and this unitary is generated by the local interactions that you are applying. But the question is, can this be done in a way that keeps the information protected? Because this code might correct errors, but during the evolution, it might be that this subsystem gets exposed to to errors for which the code was not designed. And uh, it, it, um, fault tolerant quantum computation tells you exactly how to do it. So already a lot was said about fault tolerant computation, so I'm not going to go in details, but just to refresh, uh, uh, we say that a quantum error correcting circuit is fault tolerant if an error occurring during its implementation renders the result correctable. And if we're able to do this, there is the powerful threshold theorem which tells us that uh, uh, given that, the, uh, which tells us that if the error is below some threshold per information carrier per gate, then we could achieve a, an arbitrarily long computation with polylogarithmic overhead. So um, there has been a lot of literature um, on how to do that. I'm going to here to uh, um, review simply the building blocks for, for our dynamical fault tolerance schemes, and I'm referring specifically to the formalism for the theory developed by Garzman, which applies for an arbitrary stabilizer code. Um, and um, since this basic 
operations will, will be needed in our construction. And so um, you do this by uh, being able to perform transversal unitary operations, which includes a single qubit unitaries, transversal C0, maybe transversal uh, Toffoli. Um, and in addition, we require preparation and use of a cat state of this type, we, which requires the ability to somehow create it, verify that it is uh, well prepared, and also we need the ability to do transversal C0 gates from the logical states to the cat state. In addition, of course, like any method of computation, we require the ability to perform projective measurements in the computational basis. Actually, in uh, uh, fault, uh, the fault-tolerant uh, procedures, there are smart constructions which tell us how, in terms of these basic operations, really to move the subsystem around such that it remains protected. Um, so coming back to uh, the question of um, fault-tolerant of holonomic quantum computation, Let's consider a uh, stabilizer code which encodes one qubit into n, possibly has R gauge qubits. So these are the stabilizer generators and these are the logical operators on the gauge qubits. So again, we have this decomposition. If we would like to, uh, the idea is that we would like to move the subsystem along the exactly same paths that are prescribed uh, by the standard fault tolerant procedure such that we are going to keep it protected. But um, if we would like to move the logical subsystem around in an adiabatic manner, we have to use a Hamiltonian which acts non-trivially on HB only. This should be our starting Hamiltonian. And this means that it must be, uh, a, this Hamiltonian must be a linear uh, combination of elements of the gauge group. And the same holds during the evolution. If we perform any evolution starting with this Hamiltonian, the corresponding time dependent decomposition during uh, the evolution uh, will be such uh, will be uh, such that the Hamiltonian expressed with respect to it will have that form, and this means that it is again a linear combination of the elements of the transformed gauge group because you know the all operators of stabilizer or uh, or the, the all operators of the gauge group get transformed during the evolution in the Heisenberg picture. So. The thing is that operators in the gauge group couple qubits in the same block for, if this is a non-trivial code, which means that transversality is impossible. I mean, we cannot just perform operations that address one qubit in a code or the corresponding qubits for two different uh, code words. So uh, fortunately, there is a way around this. Actually, uh, the transversal operations are not the most general ones that uh, do not cause errors to propagate, but uh, a transversal unitary followed by formation which is generated by a Hamiltonian from the gauge group is also fault tolerant. So it is exactly through this kind of transformations that we are going to drag the subsystem code around in order to generate encoded uh, gates inside it. So here is the main idea in very abstract terms, but uh, th this is what I want to convey to you. This is the main idea uh, of this approach. Basically, we are going to adiabatically drag the logical subsystem along some sequence of paths in such a way that during each segment, uh, so this path is um, divided by segments, and during each segment, the transformations in the full Hilbert space that we generate, including dynamical and geometric parts, are of the type that I just outlined. They are transversal unitaries followed by a gauge transformation. Now, you know, we're going to follow exactly uh, the pr prescription of some uh, dynamical fault tolerance scheme. But if we complete a sequence of these uh, transformations, at the end of the day, we're going to get the desired encoded operation followed by a gauge transformation. And by construction, when we, when we complete such an operation, we have taken our logical subsystem around such a loop that it, we have exactly obtained a holonomy in it uh, which is the desired encoded gate. So the first two, um, by construction, will imply fault tolerance, whereas the third uh, of these conditions um, ensures that the, the, the um, uh, computation we, we perform is purely geometric. So how do we do it? This is, the way we do it is based on, uh, on one observation. Um, so we're going to use Hamiltonians um, for simplicity, we're actually going to use at each, um, at each time only 
one element stabilizer or the, or the gauge group. So without loss of generality, we can um, choose a Hamiltonian of that type if we would like to follow this step in a fault tolerant procedure which implements a gate on, say, the first qubit in a cold world. So we choose a Hamiltonian of that type. And if we vary it uh, adiabatically in such a way that only the factor on the first qubit changes, then the resultant unitary is of that type up to a gauge transformation. And all the dynamical effects are contained in the gauge transformation. So you see that in this way, we can actually uh, implement a single qubit gate uh, in the code. And in a similar way, uh, so he, let me give you an example. For instance, let's say that we want to um, implement an X gate on the first qubit. Uh, this G tilde, I forgot to say, is just the rest, is just the rest of uh, the, dis the description of this Hamiltonian. Since it's an element of the gauge group, it is some, uh, this thing corresponds, to, uh, is, belongs to the Pauli group. So it is some tensor product of Pauli matrices. But you can think, for instance, for some nice code such as the, such as the bacon shore code, you can think that this is just another Z on a, on a nearest neighbor qubit. So you can think of this as just yet another Z on the, on the qubit. So here is the example. For a single qubit gate X, uh, what we do is we start with this Hamiltonian, we gradually turn it off and turn on another Hamiltonian of that type and then we go to the initial Hamiltonian with the minus sign. So in a similar way, we can actually mimic all the necessary um, operations in that I, uh, which are building blocks for a fault tolerance scheme. So given the three conditions that I showed, uh, being able to do this, as well as the preparation and verification of the cat state, we are able to, in a purely geometric terms, to, to perform fault tolerant quantum computation. But now, uh, there are some characteristics of this scheme. And the first one is that the threshold, uh, which is uh, defined as an error per qubit per gate, is the same as that for a dynamical scheme that we make, because we simply have uh, the same set of operations, the same number of qubits. So the error per, uh, the threshold would be the same if we follow a particular uh, fault tolerant scheme. However, since uh, adiabatic gates are slow, this, this means that the, the relative uh, weight of different errors that we allow uh, is going to change. Like, for instance, um, if, if we compare a dynamical uh, implementation of a gate and a holonomic implementation, to get failure of 10 to the minus 4, something typical for a threshold, uh, we would need holonomic gates which are from 10 to 100 times slower than the dynamical gate. And this depends on how smooth the interpolation is. Uh, th th this means that you're slowing down the evolution significantly. So, uh, and during this time, there are errors from your interaction with the environment. So this means that if this method is to be somehow useful, it must uh, provide such a precision. Uh, it, much, it, it must uh, help you in the, in the control precision um, much more than you, you lose by uh, slowing down the evolution and exposing your information uh, to possible errors from the environment, such that you would remain within the threshold. Um, another feature of this um, approach is that it requires at, at least three local Hamiltonians. But this lower bound is actually achievable with nice, nice codes such as door code. And, um, a natural question is, is it possible to do universal fault tolerant uh, holonomic computation in terms of two local Hamiltonians? For instance, using the perturbative uh, techniques to reduce the locality of the Hamiltonian. And actually for this particular scheme, as I just described it, I think that this is not possible, simply because it relies heavily on the fact that uh, the Hamiltonians are elements of the gauge group. And in or, uh, when you uh, simulate using perturbative gadgets, when you simulate a Hamiltonian, you introduce extra energy levels um, and uh, which split, and this is no longer going to preserve this uh, feature. And now this brings me to the next, the next method that I wanted to describe, which actually allows combining, um, um, which al allows using the gadgets while preserving fault tolerance. And this is a conceptually much simpler method. Basically, 
the idea is that in the previous approach, we did uh, holonomic computation in the logical subsystem. Here, the idea is to do holonomic computation in the full system of the, that describes the original codes. To do this, we need to introduce some external system. And these are gauge qubits, so we're going to essentially enlarge the code by a little bit. And we are going to perform transversal gates like this. We're simply going to um, make some interaction which leaves the desired uh, uh, the desired geometric transformation right there. And um, this, um, this scheme um, has the feature that the qubits in the same block never interact by construction. And um, now we have to use additional qubits which lowers the threshold because it, for instance to implement a two qubit gate we would need three qubits but this is a relatively small, uh, small drawback. Um, and so one nice feature is that, as I explained, you don't need to initialize the, uh, the gauge qubit. But, uh, and, uh, and the Hamiltonians are independent of the code, unlike the previous one, where you have to keep track of the stabilizer elements or the gauge uh, group elements as they evolve. And again, this one requires three local interactions, but it allows us to, to reduce the locality. So how much time do we have? Okay, so um, this, um, the way one can do this is using the so-called perturbative gadgets, which were developed by these people in a different context, but a very useful and widely applicable tool. Uh, I'm not going to explain how they work in general, but rather I will give an example. And here um, I will consider the a time-dependent Hamiltonian which appears in our construction, which uh, um, looks something like that. You are interpolating between a starting Hamiltonian which acts on uh, qubits one, two, and three. So it has this form. It acts non-trivially on qubit two and three. And then you're going uh, to turn this off. This is described by this function f of t. And you're going to turn on another interaction which uh, involves all, all, of the, all of the three qubits. The way you do it is that for each of these uh, terms, here we have two terms, each of which we can consider three local, although the first one is two local. For each of these terms, we introduce three, um, three gadget qubits. Um, S1, this set of three for the first one, and S2 for the second term. And they are prepared in the cat state, each of them. And uh, what we do is that we turn, uh, we use a Hamiltonian of the following type. It consists of a sum of uh, ancilla Hamiltonian, these are the gadget ancillas, uh, and a perturbation. This perturbation is going to split the, the base of this Hamiltonian and create effectively the Hamiltonian that we would like to obtain. Um, the ancilla Hamiltonian has this form, it is this uh, Z, uh, but it is uh, too local and has Z, uh, Z form on the neighboring qubit. So here I have described by a single line the two, the pairwise interactions that, uh, that appear in this construction. Um, we label the ancilla qubits with lower indices by S and I. S corresponds to, we, to this S here, which corresponds to the term that you're simulating whereas i corresponds to the qubit with uh, one, two, or three. And the, the perturbation that you would use in this case would have a, a form of this type. It, it consists of uh, pairwise interactions, here described by the red lines, with x axillas for each uh, of these terms, and the corresponding identity y or z uh, acting on the on the on the uh, system on the system qubit, and similarly for v2, um, there might be I'm not sure about the square root here. If it might be a, a third a, a third root, um, but the idea is that by doing so, you effectively obtain the following Hamiltonian in the ground space. Uh, you obtain the original Hamiltonian that you would like to simulate multiplied by a factor um, lambda to the third, where lambda is the perturbation parameter. It appears here, and the error that you obtain by doing so is lambda to the fourth. You, you can see that since these uh, ancillas do not interact with any other qubits, they are not any error that appears on any of the nine qubits is not going to propagate. However, you can also see that this is highly inefficient. So just to 
implement a two qubit gate, we had to introduce, we had to use nine qubits. Okay, this means that the threshold uh, is going to be nine divided by two times smaller. That's not such a big deal. The, the, the biggest problem is actually that um, these perturbative approaches reduce the gap of your Hamiltonian by a significant amount, which will require a very, very uh, significant slowdown of the evolution. So let's say that you would like to um, achieve uh, precision or error delta, so precision one minus delta with the original Hamiltonian. Some simple calculations show that in order, uh, if, uh, that in order to achieve this uh, precision with the perturbative gadgets, you would need to increase the time of the evolution by this factor of the order the original time to the power three divided by the delta to the power. So if this delta is something like 10 to the minus four, this is a huge, huge slowdown. So this rather should be regarded as a proof of principle that it is possible with two local Hamiltonians to do flow tolerant holonic computation. However, it doesn't seem very, um, very useful. So I would like to also comment on a few other schemes um, related. Uh, a very interesting paper by Bacon and Flania um, proposed a method of doing um, computation by a sequence of operations, again dragging a subsystem, a logical subsystem by different Hamiltonians, very similar to our type. But what is really cool about this scheme is that it achieves a gate just by a single interpolation between two Hamiltonians. Now, the idea, the trick is that you actually leave your subsystem on another physical system and you keep on doing this by moving your system forward as, as you do the computation. This scheme also can be understood as some form of holonomic computation, but it is an open loop. It is an open loop uh, holonomy which is the basis for the construction. I mean, open loop holonomy can be defined uh, when you have a, the final space overlaps with the initial one, so there is a natural fixing of the final frame which comes from uh, the requirement that it is most parallel to the initial frame. Um, this approach is also compatible with fault tolerant techniques and perturbative gadgets. And uh, these guys uh, further proposed another scheme inspired by this and one-way quantum computing, which is one-way computing with, without measurements, again, adiabatically dragging the subsystem such that to implement certain transformations inside it. Another paper that has appeared recently is a two-local Hamiltonian uh, without gadgets, uh, doing holonomic uh, computation in a ground state, a spin chains protected by topological order, which uh, actually uh, uses two local Hamiltonians without gadgets. Um, although I don't know of this uh, scheme being fault tolerant. And I would also like to mention another approach which is based on uh, holonomic computation by dissipation. Uh, in a paper with John Kelsamiglia, we have the developed a theory of adiabatic Markovian dynamics which allows you to move a subsystem around and implement holonomies in it. Uh, it is um, compatible with fault tolerant approach too and it also is associated with a new type of geometric phase which generalizes the, uh, the Wilczek Z holonomy or uh, Ullmann's holonomy for, um, for mixed states or any other holonomy for mixed states as a matter of fact. And uh, just to conclude, um, we have seen that uh, there exists an, uh, an approach to holonic computation which is done in subsystems which help us devise schemes that combine the purely geometric adiabatic approach uh, with uh, fault tolerant uh, constructions on error correcting codes which shows that holonic quantum computation is in principle scalable and it could also aid somehow the software protection provided by uh, quantum error correction. We have seen that two qubit Hamiltonians are universal for fault tolerant computation, but the gadgets are very inefficient. So here are a, a few open problems. Is it possible to find an old perturbative and fault tolerant realization with two qubit Hamiltonians? What physical uh, uh, systems would be um, favorable for implementing some of these ideas? And finally, can some of these ideas be useful for uh, finding a fault tolerant realization of adiabatic quantum computing. And with this, I will stop. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions for Ian? Yes, there is.
it's an apology and a question, the apology is because I was a little bit late and the question is uh, if you could expand a little bit more on the last the dissipative adiabatic uh, scheme if possible. In particular, I'd like to know um, what can you say about the locality property of the dissipators that uh, would be required in such a scheme and uh, how should I think of this in connection with the earlier uh, scheme of um, uh, like Chirac and frustrated they had a dissipative yes. uh, scheme for mm -hmm. doing encoded quantum computation? Right. Yeah. So basically the idea of this is that, um, let me go back. The, um, I mean, the idea of this, um, uh, the very notion of adiabatic Markovian dynamics that we have introduced in this paper is concerned with quasi-static evolution of the stationary states, which we know are organized in a noiseless subsystem and a cofactor which is a fixed point. So um, the idea of this uh, holonomic computation in terms of dissipation is simply if it is possible to somehow uh, engineer a Limblarian which will drag the subsystem around uh, to, to move it in a way that you would obtain non-trivial holonomies once you take it around the loop. And I should say that it also allows more general um, possibilities than the standard uh, than the standard holonomic approach based on Hamiltonians, because it allows you to move the subsystem along paths that sometimes are not possible to achieve with a Hamiltonian. And also, depending on the fixed on the noisy subsystem on the fixed state that it is in it, uh, you obtain different uh, gauge potential that describes the transformation in the noiseless path. So. Uh, uh, here I have uh, said that uh, when we have um, we're currently developing this um, idea, but in that paper with uh, John Calsamiglia, we have sh we have given some artificial example just for the sake of uh, proof that how it is possible to achieve uh, universal computation. Uh, so for this, you would need one gauge qubit, uh, on which for instance for that particular example, we imagine that you start with the Limbladian, which uh, which acts as the, um, um, as the depolarizing channel on that qubit, yes. And then you change this Limbladian, um, basically you rotate it by some unitary until you come back such so that you would obtain this non-trivial transformation. And in this respect, I would say that it is, the Limbladian is trilocal to achieve two local. And how this relates to the uh, Verstrate and uh, Sirak and Wolf um, I think it is actually quite different in the sense that the, their approach is um, closely related to adiabatic quantum computing and uh, the clock Hamiltonian. Uh, they basically, the solution there is obtained, you, you simulate a circuit, the, you, you design a, you design a Limblarian which is, uh, which uh, attracts you to a solution of the problem somehow. Whereas um, here there is no solution to a problem with implementing gates similarly in the spirit of uh, standard uh, holonomic approach. Thank you. So if you're worried about uh, the noise that splits degeneracy, since your holonomies are uh, sort of gauge operators, could you use the stabilizer of the code you know, to suppress correlated noise as DD? Um, can, can you repeat, I'm sorry? So when you're doing the holonomy, right? Yes. You worried about noise that splits the degeneracy. Yes, of course, yes. So if you assume the noise is correlated, um, could you use the stabilizers of the code, like the Bacon Shore code, as DD pulses to suppress the degeneracy splitting noise? To suppress. I haven't thought about that. So it's an interesting idea. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, in those theorems that you showed where you uh, were able to produce any target unitary on subsystem A and errors on subsystem B, okay. is there any condition on uh, relation between sizes of subsystems? No, actually the gauge subsystem must be with dimension larger than one <laughs> for the, so that it is non-trivial, but actually a qubit is sufficient. A qubit is, uh, the gauge qubit can be sufficient for any uh, system that you, you in which you contain the logical information. So let us thank Ognyan again and